Well, it's good to be together again. We were so full uh, when we had lunch. <laughs> I always forget my glasses. I, st- I think I'm still in rebellion when it comes to wearing glasses. Anybody in here in rebellion? Right. Nope, just me. Okay. I see what you did there. Tricked you. Well, this morning we're going to talk a little bit about what I was sharing with our children. It's interesting, the, the last few weeks of Jesus' life, I mean, things really escalated quickly. He comes into the, comes into the, uh, the religious capital of, of the people. He comes into Jerusalem. Uh, and back then, Jerusalem was kind of like how how we viewed the church building when I was a kid. When I was a kid, the way we approached the church building was you dress a certain way, you act a certain way, you, you look a certain way, you behave. A, I mean, it's just, it, we're going, we would, our thought was we were going into the house of the Lord. Well, that's how they thought about Jerusalem. We're going into the city of God, where the temple of God is, and the temple is where the presence of God is, and we got to cross our T's and dot our I's. I gotta, you got to say those things slowly, or it comes out very weird. And it's almost like we know how to behave when it's time to behave, and then the rest of the time we just be ourselves. And that's what's going on in this, in this big picture. Jesus has come into Jerusalem, all right? And he has this reputation of doing all these miraculous things for all these people and even for people they don't want it to happen for, he does it for them too. There's a lot of curiosity about Jesus. And there's a mob following him, and then there's a mob gathering, and then every time Jesus comes into a, a crowded place, There's always people asking for a sign. In the last few weeks, uh, Pastor Jason was talking about how Jesus did a great miracle, a sign, right? And that's the very thing that they keep asking him to do, but when he does one, it's like, well, you must have done it by the power of Satan. And the reason that they drew that conclusion is because they rejected him as a Messiah. Can't be from God. Can't be from God because you didn't come from the right lineage that had rank, power, prestige. In fact, your story is a little scandalous because you're Mother wasn't married yet. And she was poor. And she didn't come from a, a family that had certain clout of privilege. And so every time Jesus would do something gracious and merciful and powerful as a sign of his identity... And it was never good enough. You had to do it again. So that's where we find ourselves this week as Jesus comes into Jerusalem. He's been there for maybe a day or two and he's uh, confronted some resistance and he's confronted opposition and false accusations. 
And now the people are like, well, what sign will you give us? And let's go there now. Verse 27, Luke eleven, twenty-seven. 27. And so as Jesus was saying these things, as he defends himself and explains how the demonic world retreats and then comes back, as he was saying these things, a woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the one who nursed you. But Jesus said, Rather, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. And as the crowds were increasing, he began saying, This generation, or he might as well have said, My generation, or those in front of me, those who are hearing this, this generation is an evil generation. Now, how do you like that for political correctness, right? This is an evil generation. Why? Because this generation demands a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. Jesus is saying, I am the only sign you're going to get. And then he uses two historical examples. One he's already mentioned. Here they are. Exhibit one. The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them because she had enough sense, we'll say. She came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. But look, something greater than Solomon is here. The wisdom of God is here in flesh. Exhibit two. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented of Jonah's preaching. And look, something greater than Jonah is here and people did not repent. And so Jesus pulls from the history of Israel and he says, if the queen of Sheba recognized the wisdom of God in Solomon and if the wicked people of Nineveh recognize the mercy of God and the message of Jonah to repent and when God's son is here on the earth with the same message and the same wisdom, and we reject that, there is no other sign. You get no more chances. You get no more opportunity. Either believe the proclamation of the word of Christ or be judged and notice what he says about judgment. Because this is, this, by the way, the theme of these verses really is judgment. It's not signs. You've ha- you have your sign. Now you must face judgment. But it's interesting that history will judge the present. We this morning stand under some type of judgment of our own history. Our our history judges us. You get that? Whenever we try to argue for some sort of virtue, whenever we try to prove some kind of godly point about our identity, all we have to do is look at history and realize we're wrong. History proves that some of our righteous thoughts are actually just self-righteous thoughts. We're not as great as we think we are, we would say. We're not as good as we think we are. We're not as virtuous. We're not as lovely. We're not as likable as we think we are. Why? Just look at the history. And then there's Israel. They've been given the promise that God has been promising them for hundreds of years. And when the promise arrives, what do they do? Give us another sign. We don't like the one you're giving us.
just, if you'll just change the geographical location of where Jesus is from, if you'll just change who his parents are, and if he would just act a certain way and dress a certain way and live a certain way, then we'll accept the sign that you're trying to give us. But because all those other things don't fall into our paradigm of thinking, we reject Jesus based upon that. Because from our, our vantage point, he looks like a lawbreaker. Because he wines and dines with sinners. From our p- position, we uh, reject his parents. From our position, he does not have the privilege of wealth, prestige, and position. And look at how that guy, look who he chooses. No, no, that's not the sign we're asking for. And Jesus is saying, this is the only sign you're going to get. That's the message. So there's a couple of practical things I want to ask you this morning. One, in light of this, what preconceived ideas do you have that are not rooted in the scripture, but rather rooted in your earthly way of thinking. Because you've all been influenced in this room by the culture, by your favorite news channel, and by your preconceived ideas of what you think the world is about. And I have too. So the first thing we want to look at is that Jesus is the greatest sign this world will ever be gifted. And here's the sign, to be clear. Jesus was given to the world by the love of God. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave himself. He gave his son. And so Jesus comes. He he lives a life that the, the human race was meant to live. In other words, Jesus is what it looks like to me to be fully human. Jesus is what it looks like to be fully human. He looks like what it looks like to behave as God has called us to behave. To think as God has called us to think. And he died for the way that he thought, and he died for the way that he lived, and he was rejected because he obeyed God. But he rose from the grave, and he lives forevermore, and that is the sign that the world has been given. Not just you and I, but this is the sign that has been gifted to the world. And this is the message that we carry with us that we get to tell But how hard is it for us to tell the story of Jesus? But yet we will, we'll tell the story of Ukraine and we don't know really what's going on. Hmm, that's weird. We're experts on things we don't even live. And yet we won't even tell the story of Jesus who lived for us, died for us rose again for us. Tell somebody. Why? Because it's the only sign that God's going to give the world. That's why. And so Jesus makes this incredible statement. Look at verse 29 again. I mean, how would you like for Jesus to be your preacher? Think about that. Do you really want Jesus in the pulpit? Oh, I would love that. Would you? I mean, he would be gracious. He would be kind. But he would tell the truth. Let's look at two examples. Verse 29, as the crowds increased, Jesus said, this evil, this generation is an evil generation. How about that? (laughs) I mean, how many of you want to come to 
a place where Jesus is teaching, and that's what he says. And most of us, if not all of us in here, would look at like, looking around like, what? Is he, talk, is he talking to me? Well, let's back up and look at another one. Verse 27. As he was saying these things, a woman from the crowd raised her voice and he said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the one who nursed you. Now, we should assume the best about this woman. Right? She's probably doing the best she can to understand. And in her mind, how wonderful must it have been for Jesus' mother to, to birth him and to nurse him because he's such a gift. He's such a wonderful miracle worker, right? But even in her even in her best intentions, she misses the point. And sometimes in our own best intentions, we misunderstand and we miss the point. And I'm so thankful. Here, here's where you see the, the graciousness of Jesus. Jesus doesn't shame her, doesn't embarrass her. He doesn't do anything like that. In fact, he may have just simply so that's not even worth dealing with. But what does he say? Look what he says. But he said, rather, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. In other words, he was trying to say in, in a very gracious way, don't focus on my mother. Focus on the Word of God. Focus on what Jesus has come to say and accomplish and do for us. Number two, the belief that God approves of or, the, or what God is looking for is believing in His Word and obeying His voice. So you might want to ask this question, what is God looking for? What does he want me to do? Answer, to believe his word, to obey his voice. That's what he wants you to do. What does that mean? What does that require of you? One, it requires for you to know his word and to seek to hear his voice. Are you with me? I don't think it's all that complicated when it comes to what Jesus is actually saying. I think the complication comes in our own experience, in our own emotions, in our own anxieties, our own fears, our own imperfections and imperfect belief. Because we don't believe perfectly. But we must not keep coming back and saying, give us another sign. Give us another sign. Dear friends, we don't need more signs. We need more, we need more belief. We need more faith in what Christ has already said. And maybe we need to remember what he said. A wicked generation is a people asking for signs despite the signs already given. But here we go. Genuine faith is not fueled by more signs. Let me slow that down. Genuine faith is not fueled by more signs, but it is helped and fueled by obeying God's lead. And finally, every generation since Jesus is on notice is on notice as the last return and judgment are imminent. That should be one sentence. Every generation since Jesus is on notice as the last return, there's the first and then there's the last. Okay? To be clear. There's the first advent and the second advent. That means the first coming, second coming. Every generation since Jesus is on notice 
as the last return and judgment are what? Imminent. Imminent. The church for 2,000 years, including the early apostles, has consistently believed and taught this. We believe that the return of Christ is imminent. Any day he can return. Now, why is this important? It's important because so much of Christendom today is still what? Looking for signs. Why did we read Luke 21? Because Jesus said, these are the signs and these are the things that must happen before. Well, when you read that list, what do you see in the list? What do you see? You see nothing new going on. You see nothing more that needs to take place. Why? Because the signs of the end times, a wonderful subject that people love to study because people love signs, right? Right. Back to the point. The signs have been cycling ever since Jesus came and said those words. In other words, every generation sees the same signs, but we act as if they're new signs because we forget they are repeated signs. Why? Because every generation is, is in their own lane thinking about themselves and forgetting the history and the witness of what's already happened in the world. In the world. Does that make sense? Let's read the last paragraph and I will, and I will close. All signs of the end are cyclical and they come to every generation. Some Christians in some nations live with chronic signs as normal. In other words, their daily life experiences the signs daily. Other Christians in more developed and wealthier nations, i.e. America, we freak out at the first glimpse of a normal sign that other nations live with. You tracking? We get, we get beside ourselves. We'll just use that word, okay? We get beside ourselves when signs come to us when they are normal for others. You know one of the greatest signs that we've experienced in my lifetime? You might want to take a guess. It's not complicated. In my lifetime, okay, almost 50, right? We've had wars. That's a sign. In my lifetime, we have what the, the Bible calls plagues. We've had a, in, to some degree, we've had a, some type of pandemic, which, what is that? What does a pandemic do? Pandemic accelerates death. Accelerates death. Death is usually addition. A pandemic comes and death is multiplication. In my lifetime. And I'm, and I'm not even the oldest person in the room. I won't go there. But can you imagine what some of, the, some of our older generations have not only have they experience but what they've seen. And there are certain nations and there are certain races and ethnic people who've experienced an incredible amount of signs in their lifetime. Even here in our own country. What are the signs? The signs are, the signs fall under two categories. Trials and tribulations. 
Every sign falls under one of those two categories. Tribulation is more of a broad scale thing that happens to everybody without discrimination. Trials is more of a directed, targeted thing that happens to a smaller group of people or even an individual. Dear friends, we don't, we're not looking for more signs. We live in the day of signs. They're everywhere. The return of Christ is not dependent on something else happening that needs to happen. That is a, to, to think otherwise is a wrong reading of the Bible and a misunderstanding of Jesus. I know. I know, I know there are systems out there and books out there and favorite authors out there and teachers that have said otherwise, but they're making a lot of money off of people who won't simply believe what Jesus has actually just said. Don't give in to systems. Listen to the Savior. He has said what you need to believe. We should live with the tension, as I close, we should live with the tension of being both ready and waiting for the return of our risen Lord to judge the living and the dead. In the meantime, in in our waiting, readiness is our goal. What does readiness look like? Service. Service to others in the life of, the, of Christ's church. Because service is the greatest expression of our faith that is ready for Christ to return and what? Find us faithful. The question you and I have to wrestle with is this. How will we be found when Christ does return? What will he find us doing with our time, talent, and treasures? That's really the better question. Will he find us faithfully giving our lives to what he has called us to do as uncomfortable as that is and maybe like Jonah, I don't want to do it. Don't be a Jonah Christian. We could, that could be a whole other sermon right there. Well, friends, this morning I want you to leave with this idea. Live with the idea of being ready and live with the idea of expressing your faith by loving and serving each other with what you have been given, with what time you have left, with what resources you have. And if, if, if a small group of people do that, it will change the trajectory of each local church. Let's pray. Lord, again, we have tried to make a science of signs. We've tried to systematize what you did not systematize. We try to specialize in areas that you were intentionally vague on. We try to be smarter than what you have given us. So Lord, help us to return to you the greatest sign 
we will ever be given. Help us to return our thoughts to you. Help us to return our, all of our faculties to you. And help us not to trust in ourselves, in our own way of thinking, our own understanding. And help us to lean into you. To lean upon your word. To listen for your leading and your voice. It's our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.